and welcome back to Bumblebee, my historian, skeptics, and curious folks alike. Today's video will most definitely feed your fascination as it's all about the top 10 hidden symbols in famous historical artifacts. Let's start off with everyone's favorite American conspiracy theater. Number 10 will be the Statue of Liberty. Secret wisdom can be divided into two parts. First being that it is secret because the knowledge is power and that power was kept close to the masters. Second, secret wisdom is only secret because the observer does not have the necessary background to understand the message. But if you know what to look for, you can catch a lot of things, viewers. So on an exoteric level, the Statue of Liberty is peddled to be about exactly that. Liberty, freedom, America, all that. But on an esoteric level, the statue was a gift from the French Freemasons to celebrate the US centenary of being a Masonic-led country. Consequently, notable Masonic symbolism fills the giant statue, which to start is straight up a depiction of the Egyptian goddess Isis. The torch she holds is a representation of knowledge, enlightenment, illumination. The unusual fashion choice of the spikes adorning her head can be explained as a representation of the sun's rays. Have you ever heard of the York Rite of Freemasonry? The Freemasons elite club that actually refers to the three cooperative groups that confer a total of 10 degrees in the United States? Where is the statue positioned? Right in the harbor of the large city where the new York Rite of the Freemasonry was established. Also at the base of the statue is a less than subtle Masonic symbols. I mean, look at that. Y'all see it here. Come on. So in short, the Statue of Liberty is quite literally a standing testament that Freemasons were running the show hidden in plain sight. Number nine is one of the many big old rocks on this list. It's the Judicula Stone, one of America's biggest archeological mysteries. If you're one of those folks with the holes and skin phobia, this is your warning to please not look at the pictures. It's the largest petroglyph in North Carolina and historians are confused as to what the carvings are, what the strange handprint is, and what all the symbols can mean. But if you're willing to let go of science, then the Cherokee have an answer. Named after the Cherokee legend, the Judicula had supposedly landed on this rock while jumping from one mountain to the next, leaving behind his seven-fingered handprint. He had selected a bride from the Cherokee and stole her away, but the bride's mother and brother wanted their sister back. To see the bride once more, both mother and brother had fasted for seven days outside of a cave in which the sister lived with the other god spirits. However, the brother was famished after six days, and he ate a piece of meat before the end of the seventh. That enraged the beast enough to return to the physical world to punish the bride's brother, and he entered through the rock, believed by the Cherokee as the spirit stepping stone into the physical world of mortal beings. In his fit of anger, the beast kills the bride's brother, and it devastated his once happy bride to the point that she wished to return to her earthly clan. The beast did not want to lose his woman, so he compromised. All brave and faithful clansmen and women enter into internal life in the spirit world after their deaths. After this deal with the Cherokee, the clan discovered the markings on the Judicola rock, and they have since been believed to tell how one can enter into the spirit world, if you can decipher them. Number eight is the story of flight, not the actual like flight either, but like rather the word. Because some of the oldest kanji on earth, which is Chinese characters written in Japanese, for some reason mention flight. These tiles were found years ago at what scholars believe to be Japan's first Buddhist temple, Asukodera, in the Nara prefecture. Yes, the one with the cute bowing deer. So Asahi Shimbom reports the following about the curious discovery. The tiles are thought to date to the temple's founding somewhere between the end of the 6th century and the early 7th century. AD. The characters written on them are some of the oldest of their kind seen in Japan. The kanji for flight is also the first character representing the name Asuka, and the title bearing this kanji could be the oldest written material to refer to the temple. They're not sure yet though. Monks and craftsmen skilled in tile making and other items were dispatched from the kingdom of Bajeki on the Korean peninsula to Japan to construct the first clay tiled buildings on these shores. And yet it takes centuries before it's discovered how many of them were written. On. Naturally, flight catches the most attention as the word had no purpose and not much prior existence before then. For number seven, we'll take a look at the monastery walls of the oldest operating library in the world, that is. While it may be marooned on some rocks in the middle of a sandy oblivion, this little library has a collection of enigmatic manuscripts that dish out secrets. Among its thousands of ancient parchments are at least 160 pamathesets. These are the symbolic ones, as the manuscripts bear faint scratches and flesh of ink beneath.
beneath the most recent writing, aka the only clues to the words that were scraped away by the monastery's monks between the 8th and 12th centuries to reuse the parchments in St. Catherine's. Some were written in long lost languages that have almost entirely vanished from historical records. But to quote from The Atlantic, now these erased passages are being revealed thanks to an unlikely collaboration between an orthodox wing of the Christian faith and cutting edge science. Using specialized image techniques, scientists were able to read original texts that were once wiped away, revealing ancient poems and early religious texts that double the known vocabulary of languages that haven't been used for more than a thousand years. Number six, we get to gaze through a window of wonders. Founded in September of 1446 AD by Sir William St. Clair, 3rd Earl of Orkney, the Rosslyn Chapel was never technically completed due to his demise in 1484, which would make it hella strange that there's New World symbology carved into its arches. American cactus and indigenous sweet corn, which are plants found in the New World, appear in the stone reliefs when knowledge of these plants would have been impossible, as Christopher Columbus didn't stumble into those territories on accident until about 50 years after the Rosslyn Chapel was built. To explain this anomaly, it has been suggested that these plants signified a connection with the Knights of Templar and that they secretly discovered America before Columbus. These carvings, like most others in the parallel universe chapel, do not display typical Christian symbology. Rather, many of the ornate designs appear to have their origins in quite different ideologies, such as the 100 The Green Man carvings, which is a dub for men standing in outdoorsy settings recognized from pagan religion. There's also the Apprentice Pillar, on which a chain of dragons eat the roots of what's most definitely identifiable as the Nordic Tree of Life. And of course, there's the ceiling inscription. Writer Jeff Nisbet told the Herald that the carved reliefs reveal dangerous scientific knowledge. William Sinclair encoded a naturalistic message into his ceiling, but the sun acting in concert with the tilted earth and the pollinating insects make things grow, as shown in the four flower filled courses of the chapel ceiling. It seems that William was symbolically and correctly recording that our planet, contrary to church dogma, turns once daily on the axis and once annually around the sun. This would have been a rather dangerous message to write large in his chapel over the heads of the assembled Rosslyn congregation, especially in a time where the church barbecued you for doing basic addition. On to the Israeli pottery for number five. We'd thought we had a great technique, but it turns out we looked for she asses and found a kingdom. These are the words of the mathematician Barak Sober, alluding to the biblical story in which the future king Saul searches for his father's donkeys and instead meets up with the prophet Samuel, who anoints him. Sober, of course, is also referring to the accidental discovery of a secret inscription on an ostracon that had already been on display in an Israeli museum for more than 50 years. The ostracon in question is more than 3,000 years old and its surprising text was found while Michael Kordonovsky, the imaging lab and system manager at the School of Physics and Astronomy, had the idea of flipping the shard. An idea I guess none of these genius scientists had for 50 years? And he immediately found three lines of writing from two and a half millennia ago. In total, 50 new characters and 17 new words were revealed using the process, coming together to request a bunch of wine in promise of returning a favor to the recipient of the message if they had any requests of their own. Hey. Not every ancient discovery is going to be ornate. On to number four, which is some of the mosaics of the Butrent Baptistery. Whoa, that's hard to say. Today, the Baptistery is part of the Butrent Archaeological Site, which is renowned for its early Christian art and a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. Butrent was originally an Illyrian settlement and was later occupied by the Romans, who expanded the town into a city, during which time the local Christian community built the Baptistery by repurposing the Roman hypocaust so as to have hot and cold water flow through it. The entire structure was once covered by a wooden roof, but today is under open sky, with the once grand 24 columns now only standing a foot or two high each. The arrangement in three circles is believed to have symbolic value, but it's the site's mosaics that are riddled with the most symbolism. One displays two peacocks eating a cluster of grapes from a cup which symbolizes the Holy Communion, while the other features two stags drinking from a divine spring, symbolizing baptism. That means two of two major sacraments of initiation into Christianity are subtly represented on the mosaic in what could arguably just be a lovely landscape depiction. The floor, which is surprisingly well preserved considering its age, was adorned with decorative motifs that may have been used to demarcate areas during Christian ritual, and the seven circles of the mosaics that lead up to the baptismal font can be interpreted as the seven sacraments of Christianity that lead to heaven with an interwining mosaics representing eternal life and infinity. Number three is some more religion for you. it's the devout 
brain. There's a scientific secret hiding in the Sistine Chapel. Painted by Michelangelo, you may know the classic hand reach depiction of God giving Adam the first spark of life. But have you ever noticed that the flowing reddish brown cloak behind God and the angels is made in the exact same shape as a human brain? Researchers have been able to pick up subtle details, such as the angel right beneath God and his green scarf being shaped for the vertebral artery. But why a brain? Well, Michelangelo famously had beef with just about any religious figure that looked his way, and he lived to criticize literally any other person but himself. So the strongest theory so far is that he painted the brain in a covert protest of how the church had been rejecting science, rationale, and logic. Number two is the mystery of the Dandelion Stone, which was found in 2013 when a farmer plowing his field mowed it right the bleep down. Now, despite that, it was obvious the etchings on the stone were anything but man or farm plowed made. Now known as the Dandelion Stone, Stone, the pink granite boulder is 1.5 feet tall and 5.5 feet long, and it had carvings on two sides of his faces while the other two sides remained blank. This is abnormal as either pictographs are concentrated to one or no sides of a space, not, o not a little or both. The stone, they determined, was carved by the Picts, who lived in the region near the 3rd or 9th centuries with a large eagle crescent and V-rod, notch rectangle, and Z-rod. The Picts are thought to have created such stones between the 6th and 8th centuries as markers or commemorations. People often point to the hand carving, or alleged hand carving, looking similar to that of a Hamza, and the strange spirals almost appear clock-like or reminiscent of a Maya calendar. The meaning of the Pictish symbols remains a mystery, and the exact location of the find is currently unreported due to the archaeological vulnerability of the site. Okay, the one I've been waiting for, it's Judith beheading Holofernes in at number one. There is not a single painting out there that gives the ambience of Dexter and the girl power of Barbie, more so than the unbelievable set of paintings by Artemisia Gentileschi, one of the most well-known images of the Baroque era. In it, we see Judith in a darkened room, dramatically slashing the throat of Holofernes, the Assyrian general who had invaded her home city. So. Symbology is coming in at us in three layers. First up, Judith beheading Holofernes is often viewed as a reflection of the artist's own violation by her mentor, Antonio Tassi, and the grueling public trial that followed. And there's good reason for the interpretation. Artemisia used herself as the model for the depiction of Judith, a figure often said to embody female rage. This is because of the symbology of point two, how Judith went through the change during the Renaissance. She was no longer seen as a chaste and pious like in the medieval times. This new era emphasized reclaiming classic lore, and Judith was prefigured in Artemis. Therefore, she took on the new role of a warrior visage. Gentileschi's famous piece incorporated this detail in cameo bracelet on Judith's forearm depicting Artemis. The significance of this bracelet, both in its imagery and in its placement on Judith's forearm, was signaled by the spray of Holofernes' blood forward across Judith's arm, creating an arc paralleling the curvature of the cameo bracelet. Artemisia's own name means gift of Artemis, so to bring it in a full circle, it's true that she was playing on larger trends in symbolism by doing this. And speaking of blood, symbology number three would be how the gore represented the church destroying its enemies. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church turned its focus to the increasingly eye-grabbing and realistic depictions of biblical scenes in a bold campaign to reassert itself in the face of Protestantism. Then there's the Galilean science. Gentileschi was friends with the famous scientist Galileo, who met her when he had just discovered the concept of parabolic trajectory, though he would not publish his findings for decades. In essence, this law of motion states that for a projectile to come to rest from a state of motion, energy must be dissipated by the resistance over time, thus making it describe a parabolic arc in space. If you've seen the TV show Dexter, you'd know this is how the blood splatter trajectory is measured at crime scenes, the same pattern that gives such vivid quality to the blood erupting from Holofernes neck in Gentileschi's vivid painting. Thank you, thank you once again for tuning in, and I sure hope you enjoyed this artsy video. Until next time, be sure to like and subscribe, and while you're at it, maybe comment down below on if there was anything you think I missed on this countdown.